Greetings, adventurers. This marks the fifth year of me editing Dark Dice, which means my father has also been gone for five years. What was originally planned as a one-off became a welcome distraction from events unfolding in my own life, and it grew into something unexpected and special. Thank you for your part in that. In an unplanned parallel, tonight's chapter is about letting go, and I hope that if you're going through something difficult in your own life, such as losing a friend or losing everything you own that didn't fit into overhead storage in an unexpected shipping accident, as is likely also the case with me this month, that you can find the strength to move on after your loss. I say this not to encourage you to join our Patreon and support the creation of this show and its creators, but because this chapter is also our season break, as we move full-time to work on our other show, The White Vault. Caitlin and myself and the cast appreciate each and every one of you, even the skeptics we've won over this season, and we hope that the dark winter months ahead are kind to you. Our friend Jasper, the voice of Ajay Ogun, who is also the same Jasper as the new Dimension 20 show Burroughs End, is also starting up his podcast, Rotating Heroes, which may fill the uniquely Jasper-shaped void in your holiday season. So before I get a bit more emotional than I'd care to, let's let Jasper explain what he's up to and get to this week's story. Hello, I'm Zach Oyama, and I'm joining forces with Jasper William Cartwright. And we're here to bring you back The The Rotating Rotating Heroes Heroes Podcast. Podcast. But Zach, what is this show? What can people expect? We are joined by a rotating cast of some of the funniest people we know as they laugh, cry, and battle their way through the world of Amalar and commit to some of the silliest bits they can. But who are some of these heroes? Who are they played by? Uh, People like... I don't know. Emily Axford. <gasps> Love Emily Axford. Siobhan Thompson. Wow. Mike Trapp. Oh, yeah. Brennan Lee Mulligan. Yes. Ali Beardsley. Noice. Dwayne The Rock Johnson. We're going to get him. We're going to get him. <laughs> One day, he's going to reply to our emails. <laughs> Subscribe to the Rotating Heroes podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts, and be on the lookout for new episodes. On what day? Friday? Friday. Wow. Shayless D. Pace. Salis. Do you seek him? 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 Do you seek, him? Do, you seek him? Do you seek the nameless god? You have found yourself among those who roll the dark dice. What you are about to hear happened long ago. A story brought back from the edge of oblivion, dutifully transcribed, and enhanced orally to better captivate your attention. Previously, the crew and guests of the Willow's Wake had made it to the sunken bulwark a barren rock inhabited only by the sunken faithful and the spirits of their faith. As dealings concluded, the bell had rung, and it was now time for the grand ceremony to begin. Dark Dice, Shores of the Silver Thrum, Chapter 7, Last Light. The hollow ringing of an ancient bell called out, echoing across the stones and salt-sprayed cliffs of the sunken bulwark. A procession of faithful bodies had assembled behind the wooden structure of Sorrow's Edge as the deep nautical ringing continued, leading a somber pilgrimage of blue robes interrupted by the occasional sailor or guest. Among their number, near the middle of the line, walked Lady Viviana, Quinlan, Yara, and Convo who found themselves watching with quiet interest before moving to join in the strange festivities. Okay, guys, uh, blend in. Yeah, yeah, it's time for the ritual, Viviana. I'm just gonna, uh, gonna take my robe with me. It's like origami except it's rope, you know? <laughs> it's queer not. Slipknot. <laughs> Windsor, slipknot. <laughs> shh, shh, okay, okay, we gotta be quiet. It's ritual time. Try to act a, a, a little more sober, maybe? You're, you're kind of like stumbling. Okay, okay, okay. You okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Combo. Here. Combo. Come up. Let me lean on you. <sighs> Thanks. Yara is following suit, now deeply regretting that he didn't have any time to actually get rid of all the gin he drank. <laughs> As I'm helping Lon walk and she's doing her tricks with her magic rope, uh, I try to show interest and uh, 
start to try to help her sober up. She maybe won't notice how nauseous she's going to be in a little bit. Uh, I'm kind of asking her questions like, uh, can you make it to a bowline? Done. Uh, how about a reef knot? <laughs> Easy peasy. Oh, make it do a clove hitch. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> so cool. So worth it. Yes. Yes, it was. So, Yara has a very special ability, and he would like to use it without drawing attention to himself by casually asking, That's an interesting rope. Can I, can I touch it? Can I just see what it's... The, the craftsmanship of it? Are you casting Identify or just looking at it? Oh, I assure you that I am going to try and identify its quality if you'll permit me to touch it, uh, though I do not know the spell Identify. Yes, I permit. Everybody may touch. Yare touched the rope and opened his mind to an extrasensory awareness to feel whether or not death had touched the object in his hands. As he closed his eyes and felt its rough texture, a foul sensation rose from his stomach, a feeling of tension. Then the hairs on his ears bristled as though a loud snap echoed on a frequency just below audibility. The air shifted as the snap shot down below his neck, a feeling followed by a sickening crack and a most unpleasant sensation as his lungs burned, his limbs prickled, and his head swung achingly dull side to side. Yara could not be sure if it was accidental or intentional, but he was sure that death had touched this rope. And worse yet, death was all around him on this island. Yara shuddered, opening his eyes to truly examine the simple rope in his hands. Okay, well, I, I, I don't know what you're going to use this for, but I really hope you didn't pay too much for it. Um, because this... You look a bit off, Yare. Does the rope... Uh, would you say it doesn't give you good vibes? Um, I definitely wouldn't say it's giving me good vibes. But I don't think it's unlucky or anything, if that makes any sense. I see. Uh, just be careful with it, maybe. We're getting left behind, guys. Let's go. Convo! Let's go! Let's go! Let's go! Hustle! 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 At first, the quiet procession led past a small path through the stone, and then to a large section of somewhat flat black boulders which jutted through the very sea itself, leading out toward the enormous temple waiting in the waters, visible even from this distance as the thick fog abated. The path itself, which would be under the rising tide within a few hours, was slippery as waves crashed just beneath carrying with them the odors of salt and marine stench. Here the sunken priests had learned the surest footing out and back from their holy temple, but for all others this turbulent way was very difficult to cross, perhaps intended as a test of faith for those on a path of pilgrimage. To be scared, to approach such a temple, such a house of gods, a home to the mother of seas, violent and uncaring, to do this was to supplicate under the smallest fraction of her power. At the distant edge of the procession, some of the larger priests carried a number of hefty boxes covered in simple white cloth. The largest of these boxes was carried over the shoulders of six barrel-bodied priests by long metal poles. But this curiosity passed from thought as the form of the temple itself came into clearer view. The sight of that grand temple, and the way the blue procession wound toward it, Cut through the dark ocean itself was enough to give one pause. Viviana, Convo, and Yara passed their sanity saving throws. However, Lon, whose head was a swirling mix of alcohol and the nightmares waiting back home, saw before her a grand creature, terrible to behold, with massive looming tendrils that seemed to crawl out from the deep, reaching toward the islands that comprised the sunken bulwark. Lon took five stress damage, and as she was quickly guided by Convo, feet moving against her conscious will, she realized it never once moved, it never writhed, never went back into the ocean below, and all at once she understood that this monstrosity was carved from stone. Her brief glimpse at a terrible abomination was nothing more than the anxiety-born dream of her drunk and stress-addled mind. At the end of the tideway, rising up from the powerful white crash of waves, 
dwelled a gargantuan temple carved from a single spire of black stone. If Lan's memory served, the temple had been carved by giants into the form of an outlandish tentacled sea creature, with a mouth and body of swirling, wrapping appendages, pillars that twisted around themselves in multitudes, diving into and out up from the sea again. In the haze even beyond the great, terrible temple stood the three remaining arms of the bulwark. Once more in number, these three remaining massive stone pillars were carved in the likeness of giants of old, some of the first and strongest acolytes of the Sunken One. These statues held no entrances and could not be reached, as they simply stood sentinel over the temple in quiet decay. Worn by the elements, their cracked, headless visages were no less imposing. Yara found that as they moved towards the temple, Seely was increasingly agitated, and soothing her would require an animal handling check. Seventeen. And so she was soothed. Uncomfortable but shifting her attention to Yara, it was clear that Seely expected food later in payment for her obedience. But would the shipwright bring her into the temple? So having having calmed her down, Yara is calming her down, talking to her soothingly. Um, and then he's gonna do the double tap again, and she's gonna fly off, and he chooses not to bring her. And then hanging back at around the... where Viviana is going, he's he's kind of hanging back with her and entering the temple. They continued through the carved stone into the temple itself. It was clear the faithful had made no effort to keep out the cold, wet, which permeated rock and skin alike. Such was the touch of the sunken one. But the temple was clean, mopped with salt water, barnacles scraped away, seaweed and kelp collected and put aside for later use. The walls flickered under the firelight, revealing detailed mosaics pieced together with minute tiles of knacker, creating detailed nautical scenes that appeared to shift and move in the firelight. Great statues carved from driftwood trunks, saints of the sunken faith, stood sentinel within the hall as blue-robed priests ushered guests beneath their fearsome visages. All the while walking down the path of deeply stirring yet intimidating beauty, the roars of the waves crashed, from somewhere below perhaps, rolling in a massive unseen cave. Their thunderous crashes roared up through narrow pits and holes along the floors and walls. Before long, the team reached a grand chamber fit for giants, with walls that rose three stories tall, filling the belly of the great carved beast with winding mosaics and shining marine light. I would like to take a, a kind of quick mental picture as to who's who in the zoo. As Convo walked in, taking note of who might be potentially dangerous or disruptive, he observed that people seemed to be split left and right, creating rows on either side of the center path, like the pews of a church. Yet none were seated, as no place to sit was provided. It was clear to Convo rather quickly that guests to the temple grouped themselves by ship or congregation, as blue robe pilgrims from across the continent had made their journey. On the left-hand side, Convo saw Harquin, Salen, and other members of the Round Nag, the pirates forming two orderly rows. Behind them appeared to be a crew of elven merchants, one casting a sneer to deflect their brief eye contact. And on the right, somewhere near the front, Convo saw not only Captain Galmain, Yelena, and Becher, but also Vind Greyview, who looked worse for wear than when he'd last seen him, and a few of the other crew members that he hadn't seen since coming ashore. Four large statues lined the far wall, and a simple hole between them, ten feet wide, marked that holiest place, the Tide Altar. Adorning the room were closed doors to the far left and right, carved into the curved walls of the circular chamber and tiled with minuscule mosaic. A rippling glow ushered further from beyond the doors, but it could just have been more of those mosaics and firelight. The floor of the Grand Temple was carved to create intentional indentations, each filled with seawater to create small puddles to help reflect light. So, uh, we should join folks from the willow over there. Uh, oh, mind your step. It's a bit slippery. Thanks. Um, could we perhaps stand in the row behind them? Like, just a bit closer toward the X-Eye? 
I mean, the central row. Yeah, sure, okay. But I want to stand next to the captain. Yare and Kanvo exchanged a glance but could only shrug as they approached the captain. And by proxy, most of the crew of the Willow's Wake. Hey, Zuzaman. Go over here. Here. Hey. Servus. Und. Thanks again for your help earlier. Don't mention it. Seriously. Don't bring it up around the captain. Seems like we still made it in time for the, the thing. Yeah. Not sure what you did to that card at work today, but I'm a bit jealous. Deck and Yelena winked at Convo before lightly elbowing him. I assure you, whatever you dealt with was a lot easier than what I had to do with. But it was so much fun. <laughs> Got it just in time. The sunken mother's gonna come in soon. Get in line and stay quiet. Yes, sir. Then, you don't look so good. Are you okay? I didn't think we were supposed to cry at this thing. Vind wiped tears from his eyes, reflecting on a promise he'd made to his people and his patron, the sacrifices he'd made to get here. Lon's words pulled him from these thoughts, but before he could respond... A trickle of new arrivals came to a slow end as the rows filled with the sunken faithful and the bulwarks visitors alike. It seemed as though the ocean itself quieted in preparation for the forthcoming, and suddenly all stirred. There was the sounding of a great conch horn, and as the sonorous horn rang out, attentions turned to the aisle, as an old woman, standing nearly seven feet tall, entered the grand chamber. She strode between the rows like a lion stalking slowly towards trapped prey, appraising those present with her eyes, two above and two below which were vestigial, but made plain her giant ancestry. The looming shade wore a great headdress adorned in ghostly gray driftwood, silver wound wire, shining knacker, and gleaming pearls. She showed not an ounce of worry or pain, but a cruel indifference. Walking slowly upon the wet rock with bare feet, she held aloft before her a great silver basin, heavy with sacred seawater. She approached the very edge of the tide altar, a great hole set within the front of the room her toes peeking over the deep drop, and then motioned first to her left, then to her right. Blue-robed Faithful approached her, opening up silver and knacker censers to dunk in the sacred water. These priests, one for each row, walked through the lines of onlookers, merchants, sailors, pilgrims, and pirates alike, splashing them with the holy sea water contained within their swinging censers. As the sacred water splashed upon Yara's skin, he felt a sting, then burn like salt on a fresh wound. Yara gained one stress and two acid damage as he knew that perhaps this holy cleansing might be indicative of his standing with the sunken one. Oh, mosquitoes in these damn places. Having spent a lot of time on the sea, he's used to hurt, so he will have flinched but he has had himself under control rather quickly. Still, the smile from a trek earlier has disappeared from his face, and he is now very aware that maybe this isn't the right place for him. The more the gathered crew and guests stared at her, the more they saw how strange her costume was. The sunken mother was adorned with the jewels of the sea, but her robes were made from worn, sun-whipped sails her cape a dirty fishing net studded with pearls, and her belt a thick line of rope fastened with a silver brooch. The old and new, the rich and poor, the sea contains it all. The gray-skinned woman tipped out the remaining holy water at her feet, some flowing down into the tide altar, some extending as far back as the boots of the onlookers. A lesser priest took the great basin away as the mother bellowed, her voice carving and echoing across the silent chamber. Bring forth the light of the golden sun, for we cast it into the depths, down to the sunken one, until the long night runs its course and the sea permits it to rise again. Four priests bowed and left the chamber, returning quickly laden down with a large heavy object, hidden beneath a heavy canvas tarp. They placed the object at the edge of the tide altar, and with an echoing ring they pulled the metal poles away, leaving only the strange covered mass. 
the sunken mother walked up and placed her hand upon the canvas. So we cast you down to the depths, to the great and deep sunken one. In a magnificent flourish, the giant has dashed away the canvas, exposing the buffed and gleaming gold of a statue as large as a seated tiger and just as fearsome. It depicted the visage of Selagon, the god of the sun, lord of light, the morning lord, gleaming in masterwork carved brilliance. But there was scant time to examine the statue before the sunken mother pushed the golden mass into the tide altar without effort or hesitation. It was instantly swallowed up, the waves of the sea rising to meet it with a roar, for no wealth of gold can stop their power. The sunken mother turned again to the crowd, her voice ringing through the temple. May we not see the light of the sun again until the great and deep sunken one bids it so. For to see its splendor here now would mean we have passed to the lands of the dead. May this blessing go with you. May, May this, this blessing, blessing go, go with you. you. The congregation repeated her blessing, monotone and practiced. The sunken mother, having offered up the golden idol, moved with the grace of a youth to the other side of the tide altar, where she would stand to watch and judge the offerings to come. Those with personal offerings may now step forward. Two priests stood before the tide altar to bear witness as others helped organize a procession from each side, so that any who had such a desire could present their personal offerings to one of the lead sunken priests. The priests examined these items before tossing them into the tide altar. And as personal items vanished from sight below, the sunken mother peered down into the crashing waves before decreeing a calm and muted blessing. Those from the Willow's Wake were near the front of the line, and second mate Av Mitov found herself leading them, clearly nervous. Captain Gelmain whispered kind words of encouragement, but with so many other distractions and complications, none could be sure if it worked. Av's sturdy and well-calloused hands gripped a small wooden box no larger than a finch. Her feet shook slightly, and her grip quivered. But her eyes remained focused as she handed the small box over to the blue-robed priest beside the tide altar. I, Avmitov, of the lowland spring tides, bring these earrings for the sunken one. They were my mother's. Down the box was cast into the roaring depths below. Av's face held steady, but her eyes betrayed the gleam of tears. The sunken mother gazed down into the roiling waves, and with the slightest of nods and eyes that pierced her soul, she whispered to Av. Keep this way. Aye. Captain Gelmain briefly stepped out of line, resting a consoling hand on Av's shoulder as she passed. Then, producing a wooden chest the size of a bread box he'd brought with him from the willow, he spoke. I, Victor to Gelmain, give this box a quartz from the distant temple. Too long has it been since my last offering to Alnil Beach. With faithful supplication, the captain handed over the box to the priest. And within a moment, it was tossed into the altar, the glittering stones inside, never to see the light of day again. The sunken mother gazed at the waves and read what she could see. She held the eyes of the captain for a moment before speaking. Your offering is fortuitous. Keep this way, and know not her ire. The captain bowed, and with a look of relief, he returned to the row where his crew waited. For a moment, there was a pause, as other members of the Willow's Wake were given the opportunity to give offerings alongside their captain. Some sailors brought scrimshaw, others bottles of fine wine, and only Vind could see that Yuahai sheepishly rested a hand atop a thin book, and the branch that Ajay had given her. She had been true to her word. Yet even as these two were cast down to the depths, Vind could swear that he heard the sunken mother angrily hiss, The blessing shall remain. And so, Yuahai turned on heel, departing the temple entirely. So Vind, being next in line, slowly approaches the priest, holding in his hands a feather and staring down into the dizzying depths of the tide altar as he speaks. <clears throat> um, I am... <clears throat> I am Vin Graveview of the the Shade Elves from the Blackstone Forest. I have with me a rare feather um, from a morning thrill catcher that has been with my family for generations. It... As Vin stared at the ebbing and crashing waters twenty feet beneath him through the tide altar, 
His words seemed to die in his throat, as the body of Nimble Rumble, his traveling companion as of only an hour ago, appeared blue and tangled in a mess of ropes as it struck the side of the Tide Altar's rocks. His lifeless, unfocused eyes were wide with fear, and even now he seemed so small, so frail. It... Duh. It... It, um... It... And with the next wave, the corpse was pulled down beneath the water, if it in fact had ever been there at all, and Vind's stress rose. I'm sorry for the hesitation and stuttering. Um, I know this is supposed to be a glorious, fulfilling moment. As I was explaining, the, the um, feather... It's, it's not just something from a rare beast of the sky. It's also one of the most sacred tools in my community as its healing properties have, um, have saved many lives over the centuries. It could have even saved my brother if he'd had it. May this offering be of nourishment and health to you, all Neldich and the creatures of your domain. And may you accept this as a penance for any perceived wrongdoings on behalf of on behalf of all of my community or me. The sunken mother's harsh, unblinking gaze made Vind uncomfortable. The sacrifices made today shall spare your people from her wrath. May this blessing go with you. Um, but what about me? It's a little cryptic. I mean, does that include me as well? The unblinking stare continued to pierce him as the priest guided a nervous Vind grave you away from the tide altar. Vind returned to his place within the rose, and as he did so he saw someone familiar standing at the back of the line, the tall form of Ajay Ogun. There was only a brief moment in seeing his friend, before this shifted to fear, remembering what had only just come to pass. Vin blinked and rubbed his eyes in an effort to make him vanish, but Aje remained, his eyes blankly ahead, as if in a trance. Vin tried to see if anyone interacted with Aje, or if it was perhaps the spirit of the shaman, and Vin's chest physically ached as more and more it seemed as though the orc, who had defied death once before, might have done so again. It was at this time that Quin Lan reached the Tide Altar. Hesitating before staring off into the dark waters below for longer than the priest seemed comfortable with. Do you have an offering to present to the great and ancient sunken one? Yeah, 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 yeah. I come from the ship of the Willow's Wake, and I represent the people of Dalaria. I am of my own faith, but I come with good will. And I'm here to present a hairpin that has been passed on to me by my deceased grandmother. It is made of opal, and I wish to receive a good blessing from the sunken goddess. And with that, Lon recites a few verses of poetry in the Eastern Dolarian tongue. For who has not been dead in history, if to be dead, if one is to be dead in the end, why not fight until the death for a goal worth fighting for? And with that, she gives a hairpin to the priest and watches him toss it into the crevasse. She sees it fall and sink into the ocean and looks at the sunken mother for guidance. Your sails, your boards, and your mast will not know the sunken one's wrath for as long as you live. Do not stray and keep this way. Thank you. Keep this way. Thank you so much. And Lon goes back to her group. Fidgeting with his sash, Convo was next to step up to the tide altar, reluctantly producing his stick and poke tattoo kit. The wood of the handle shone from wear and oils accumulated over decades, and while the objects held little monetary value, they represented so much more to the man holding them. As his fingers touched the wooden handle, he recalled the physical sensation of applying ink to the skin of Captain Rose, the soothing kisses that would often accompany their ritual, and the sensation of her tapping the ink of new art and adventures into his skin. <sighs> uh, I... I sacrifice... 
I sacrifice. I sacrifice my hopes and dreams. What I had with someone. Someone that was important to me. The hope and the dream that I would find her somewhere else. In another beach. Somewhere by a shore. Somehow still alive. Or that any of my old crew, my family, could still be out there. I give these hopes to you. I sacrifice these to you, all sunken one, so that what I do not sacrifice can be a life that I will continue to live well, and for them, for as long as you'll allow, till my very last breath. And, uh, he hands over the stick and poker. The priest accepted the pieces, scanning them over before sending them into the tide altar. Convo watched as they were consumed by the waves below. The sunken mother looked at Convo with slight pause before speaking. The sunken one can never take back that which she has done. That is not the way of the sea. But she can see that her ire does not tear your sails, nor her children cross your path. Do not stray, and keep this way. And I walk away. Uh, this is going to go horribly wrong because of the whole Sansa thing, but Yara will step up, and uh, because the only thing of value he has is that hooded lantern and... The thought of pouring oil into the ocean doesn't sit well with him on some level. Um, he's going to pull out a certain corkscrew, which is the only other thing of real value to him, as it reminds him of that nice moment down in the kitchen. Um, and he's going to offer it up and say, Mögen die, die die See befahren, ihre Gerechtigkeit erfahren. Which roughly translates to uh, may those who travel the seas be subjected to her justice. Which is actually kind of a blessing, but in this case has a certain threat ringing through. The priest took the corkscrew, scowling at it before it too was dropped down into the waves below, consumed within the crashing waters. The sunken mother locked her eyes on the tide altar, bouncing her head ever so slightly as though listening to a distant lullaby. With an echoing break of a wave below, she snapped her view to Yara, locking eyes with him. A tumultuous happening approaches, which you cannot succeed. But perhaps failure will bring you where you need to go. The sands do not know where they go, or why. Accepting what she said, stepping back, back to his place. Quiet. Vind Greyview stared unblinkingly as... Among the final ones to give an offering stood Ajay Ogun, tired and battered, but breathing. Those around him seemed to regard his presence as well, so Vin felt increasingly confident that this was no mere hallucination. As the shaman reached the front of the line, he produced a small vial of water. I would like to make an offering on behalf of another, for his home. The Shade Hill River has been stricken like many within our great forest. I believe he would have liked all Neldich to have this, in hopes that she might admire his bravery and compassion, and his willingness to sacrifice anything for his friends. May he be remembered by her. May his feats as a warrior, and as an even better person, inspire the Sunken One to spare his people from her wrath. The priest ran his finger over the cracks in the glass vial before dropping it down into the tide altar. The sunken mother leaned in to whisper. The sunken one has met your friend, and for his deeds and your own humble request, his people might know her bounty. Ajay has a small fishing dagger in his hand, looks down at it, looks up at the priest for a second, kind of looks at the altar, and then sheaths the dagger, and I think Ajay is just gonna, if this is permissible, is just gonna leave the room. 
None stopped Ajay as he simply left the temple, as the final call for personal offerings was sounded. Do any others have a personal offering to make? As the last of the congregation returned to their rows, the sunken mother waved a hand toward the side door and closed her eyes in quick reverence before continuing. May these blessings go with you. Keep this way. Keep Keep this this way. way. Now, the ships in waiting have brought their sacrifices. The priest next to her held out a small tarnished bowl. From it she pulled a shell and read the name inscribed upon it. The Blackbird. The priests disappeared once more down a side hall, returning with a large glass container inside which twitched and wriggled an angry scorpion larger than a gnome. An adolescent giant scorpion, few of which will ever spy the sea. She nodded slowly, and a moment later the priests tossed the glass down into the tide altar. Over the crashing waters the glass was not heard to break. The mast, boards, and sails of the Blackburn will not know the sunken one's ire. Her gaze lingered on the ship's captain for a few moments more before she pulled another shell from the bowl. The willows wake. The priests disappeared once more. With a roar, they shuffled back, each burly priest straining to hold a catch pole in hand, forcing the owl bear from the willows wake slowly toward the tide. An owl bear. Creature of woods and sky. All heads turned to look at Viviana for her outburst, but their interest only lasted a moment. Here, the will of the gods was more important, and so attentions returned to the ritual. Now we cast you down, an offering to the great and deep sunken one. The priests, full force of their might behind them, began to push the creature toward the edge. What do we do? That's lovely! Well, if you want to do something, now's the chance. Maybe use your new noise toy or whatever. You know, like, to divert them. That's actually a very good idea. Viviana cuts the 18 second keys in half with her dagger. Very reluctantly, Yara, knowing what she's about, is going to pass her his tinder box, not getting involved any further than that just now. I light the first one and roll it toward the middle of the room. When the explosion goes off, I run as fast as I can toward the burly priests holding Fluffy, and I'm going to slice the hell out of their ankles. Uh, Well, um, with the party taking their first step toward a total party kill, it's a good time for us to end this episode and announce a season break while we get to work on the White Vault Goshawk. Fans of that show make up 90% of our patrons, so we'll be back in March with more Dark Dice. We'll see you when the light returns from winter, and until then keep this way. Dark Dice, Shores of the Silver Thrum, Chapter 7, Last Light. Created by Travis Vengroff and K.A. Stats. Featuring Lily Pichu as Viviana Bloodchamber, Eric Nelson as Vind Grafew, Jasper William Cartwright as Ajay Ogun, Florian Zeitler as Yara, Enrique Perez as Convo, Sophie Yang as Lan, Sam Yao as Yuahai, K.A. Stats and Travis Vengroff as co-dungeon masters. Featuring the voices of Lonnie Manila, Clara Skiprick, Ryan Philbrook, Kira Baxendale, and Kareem Cromfley. This episode was produced and edited with sound design by Travis Vengroff, with dialogue editing assistance by Kayla Shu, mixing and mastering by Dane Leonardson, transcriptions by Shean Francois, and executive producers Dennis Greenhill, Carol Vengroff, AJ Punkin, and Michael Villegas. This episode features music by David Wise, Stephen Malin, Brandon Boone, and Travis Vengroff. To support this production and get ad-free access to bonus releases, music, world lore, art, and early access to future adventures and d materials, please join our Patreon at patreon.com slash foolandscholar. This is a Fool and Scholar production. Thank you for listening. <laughs>